This is CBRX, uh, who are a US device company, um, who are going to be telling us about um, uh, a physiologic approach to treatment of resistant hypertension. Um, and of course, having heard uh, the last uh, talk of this morning's session, we shouldn't be at all surprised that uh, companies are getting interested in devices to influence uh, the sympathetic uh, 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 modulating effects uh, from the, uh, uh, carot from the uh, carotid arteries. And um, I think that's the sort of thing we're going to hear about today. So thanks very much for coming along. Thanks for sponsoring the meeting. And we'll look forward to hearing what you say. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be uh, involved with um, this exciting meeting about the innovations of uh, the management of hypertension. Um, <clears throat> we have three eminent speakers today, um, Dr. Eric Lovett, uh, Dr. Jim Georgiakopoulos, and Professor Dal Francis, who will each uh, give you individual presentations, which will hopefully be enlightening uh, and stimulating. And uh, hopefully we should have enough t time at the end for um, a discussion and some questions. So if we can keep the questions ideally to the end of all three presentations, and then uh, that way we'll maximize the time for, uh, for the discussion. So without further ado, I won't eat into the time anymore. I know we have a hard stop for two o'clock. Uh, absolutely. So um, welcome, uh, Dr. Eric Lovett. Thank you. Thank you, James. By way of disclosure, I am the Senior Director of Research at CVRX, so I'm an employee of the, of the company. I want to introduce you to uh, baroreflex activation therapy, also known as barostim therapy. Uh, essentially, what barostim therapy is, is a electrical, chronic electrical activation of the baroreflex. Uh, the result of that activation is a realignment of autonomic tone, uh, reducing sympathetic activity and increasing parasympathetic activity with a host of circulatory effects that my colleague, uh, Jim George Kopoulos, will discuss shortly. The way the therapy is applied is through an implantable pulse generator similar to a pacemaker that is implanted in the chest uh, with a single lead uh, with the current model that, uh, thank you, that uh, uh, with an electrode connected to the carotid sinus. Uh, the system is controlled by a computer, basically a laptop computer with an antenna. Uh, the system is fully programmable and titratable uh, to the individual's needs. This is the current generation system. Uh, as I mentioned, with a single lead. The earlier generation system, the Rios device, was a, a uh, bilateral lead uh, that required uh, greater mobilization of the carotid arteries bilaterally for the implant, whereas the current generation system requires only superficial uh, exposure of the carotid sinus for application of the electrode. Perhaps the most uh, comprehensive study of uh, bar barrel stem therapy to date has been the Rios Pivotal Trial, in which we enrolled 322 uh, resistant hypertension patients. The characteristics of these patients are very much like those uh, that you saw earlier from the uh, uh, Simplicity 3 trial. Uh, there were three groups in the trial. T uh, two of them were randomized. Uh, in the randomized groups, uh, patients were randomized to e either receive therapy immediately, that is uh, one month after implant of the system, or a deferred activation, uh, activation uh, beginning six months after implant. Uh, from from uh, baseline pressures pre-activation uh, around 170, uh, so at six months reductions in pressures uh, of about 16 millimeters of mercury relative to pre-implant in the control group, that is the sham control group, so these patients were implanted, uh, whereas group A had a reduction of 26 millimeters of mercury. So uh, while there was an effect in every patient that was submitted to the procedure, the effect in the patients who had active therapy was considerably more. Uh, when the sham patients were activated at six months, uh, they had a, a significant pressure drop uh, at 12 months after that six months of therapy that was put them at a level comparable to the patients who had been activated uh, earlier in the study. We have now followed these patients out uh, to as far as, in some cases, six years from this trial. Uh, we have a reasonable number of patients through five years uh, of follow-up, and the pressure reductions have been maintained in those patients throughout that, uh, that duration. The second generation system uh, was evaluated in an open label uh, verification trial uh, of 30 patients in which uh, office cuff blood pressure was measured and the reductions in blood pressure here were very similar to what was seen in the immediate activation group from the Rios Pivotal trial. In fact, numerically they were identical in 26 millimeters of mercury reduction at six months. Uh, 
for the current generation system, the implant time of the system uh, takes about an hour and 45 minutes. Around 45 minutes of that time is to determine the proper placement of the electrode. So it's important to identify the most responsive site on the carotid sinus and place the electrode uh, to do that. With experience, the implant time is reduced to approximately an hour and a half, and that has, that has been maintained in our commercial experience with the system in Europe. Uh, in terms of safety profile of the system, uh, the current generation system has, has an excellent safety profile. There are a few perioperative events which mainly had to do with uh, uh, some discomfort near the placement of the, of near the, near the uh, location of the pulse generator. Uh, and uh, there are essentially no uh, safety events after approximately one month. And this, this safety profile is very similar to a pacemaker system. So I will turn it over now to Dr. George Akopoulos to discuss mechanisms of the therapy. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you again for attending and uh, allowing us this opportunity to present, uh, uh, present some of our work. Um, just for my disclosure, I, I am an employee of CBRX, and uh, even worse, I'm a, I'm a hemodynamicist, so I view the world as two signals, basically. If you can measure pressure and flow, I think you can understand all the physiologic uh, physiology of a circulatory system. Um, I'd like to point out some of the experiments that we've done, preclinical studies and some clinical work as well, to show that modulating the autonomic nervous system has extremely powerful hemodynamic effects. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we're not seeing some, some more of this uh, uh, data collected um, in some of the, uh, the current therapies that are looking at uh, modulation of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, the crest of this fine institution, I view it as uh, sort of the first hemodynamic uh, attempt at a, at a measurement by uh, measuring the pulse. You can see the quote here from 1872. The pulse contains virtually all the information. Short of putting a catheter in the system, people who are skilled at measuring the pulse can assess not only the arterial system, but the properties are the heart as well. The, the pulse really represents a coupling of the heart and the arterial system. And I think that's also another point that people are ignoring right now, is that the two systems have to work together. It's a close circulatory system, and uh, as much as the vascular system is affected by the heart, the heart is affected by the vascular system as well. Uh, apologize for the whirlwind uh, uh, tour here. This is going to be pretty quick, but I need to summarize 15,000, nearly 15,000 publications on bare reflex physiology in about five minutes. Um, of course, as uh, Dr. Payton mentioned in his excellent talk earlier, uh, as, a, as a primary goal, part of this is improving the, the gain of the bare reflex. The control of heart rate, which is a very simple assessment of reduced sympathetic tone and elevated parasympathetic tone at rest. Um, and this is, again, this is a clinical study that we did with the first generation device looking at heart rate variability analysis and showing that, indeed, by electrically activating the, gear, the barrel reflex, we can restore some of that function which is lost for whatever reason. Now, what are the hemodynamic effects of this? If you look at the barrel reflex here, as Dr. Payton mentioned, it's one of the most potent sympathoinhibitory reflexes in the body when you activate it. And it's... Uh, it affects really the key components of the circulatory system, the heart, the kidneys, and the blood vessels. Again, my distorted view of the, of the world, this is how I view physiology. So this is every compartment um, uh, in the cardiovascular system, uh, the, the veins, the kidneys, the heart, um, the systemic arteries. Um, and, and if you look at uh, two things here, the autonomic nervous system influences every component of this, of this cascade. And secondly, all these boxes are interconnected, which means if you make a change in one compartment, you're affecting a change in the other compartment. And so the autonomic nervous system orchestrates all these effects at the same time, which is very, very unique from all other drugs or interventions which act downstream of the autonomic nervous system. And the baroreceptor is, which I can't spell, is the American version of baroreceptor. Uh, um, is actually sitting one level higher and is pinging the autonomic nervous system. Just as a brief aside, um, I, I want to focus, because a lot of the talks today obviously are focused on, on hypertension and to some degree on heart failure, but like everything else in physiology, there's nothing new anymore. Uh, we just have fancy devices and iPhones right now that speak to the, the, the devices. But in, in the late 60s, Dr. Braunwald out of the NIH had a device that was made by Medtronic that was similar in nature to what we're doing, although the mode of stimulation is different. But the original indication was for the treatment of angina. So if you look at these patients, they had multi-vessel disease, they weren't hypertensive, 
but yet this therapy was used to treat uh, to treat um, um, refractory angina at the time. So let's focus on the arteries first. And again, you see the sympathohibitory effect of activating the bare reflexes of MSNA, like uh, like Professor Peyton showed earlier. And you can see how this correlates nicely with the blood pressure drops. This is from a patient that had uh, implanted the device for three months, was brought back into the clinic, and had these measurements made. More importantly, though, if you look at again the waveforms. This is in the off state. This is just regular uh, intraradial waveform that we, that we digitized here. Look at the off and the on state, and you can see really the dramatic changes that you see in the, wave, in the properties of the waveform. So it's not just a drop in blood pressure, which is quite substantial in this patient, but this waveform now is completely normalized. To the, if you look at some textbook pictures, this is a very young patient, middle-aged and old patient. You can see now this young waveform now is, resembles a 60-year-old patient. So the ability of the autonomic, not only the autonomic nervous, nervous system to modulate blood pressure, but to actually restore a very physiologic form of the cardiovascular system. Some old studies, again, from the 70s, sort of comparison uh, uh, doing supine. You could see the primary mechanism of activating the barrel reflex is a reduction in peripheral resistance and an increase in the stroke volume of what is happening here. And then you could see an upright this stroke volume increase is still maintained or is blunted a little bit. So even when the patients stand up, despite this sort of artificial electrical activation of the bare reflex, the system is still able to compensate and, 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 and maintain the reduced pressures. This is, again, very different from another potent sympathetic like clonidine. And this is how the two systems differ when you provide a physiologic stimulus versus a, a pharmacologic. You can see with clonidine, the primary effect of clonidine is to reduce stroke volume. And, that's how it, and it reduces stroke volume and heart rate and that's how it drops blood pressure, by reducing cardiac output. That's why patients feel horrible when they're on quantity, even though I'm not a physician. Um, moving on to the venous system, uh, a very, very important system, and, and I think probably the predominant effect of how the bare reflex is working. Um, this, this quote by Starling is more relevant, I think, even today than it was uh, more than 100 years ago. But it's, um, if, if it, there's, there are very clinical consequences to having elevated venous pressures and, 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 and elevated volume status. And if there's a study by uh, Dr. Esther's group looking at cardiac spillover with the level of the wedge pressure, and see if there's a relatively linear correlation, the higher your wedge pressure, the more sympathetic activation that this generates. We did some studies with uh, John Tyberg's lab uh, up in Calgary. I won't go into this, but we basically, we had flow, uh, flow probes on the aorta and the IVC and just measured flow that was coming out and flow that was going back in and zeroed them. And then activated the device here. These are normal, normal tensive of canines. You can see here, we had turned on the device here, got about a 30 millimeter drop in blood pressure, and now we're integrating that flow. And an increase in flow here means, um, or volume means that volume is being transferred from the heart and lungs out into the abdominal viscera, which is the primary storage of, of, of the blood volume. We recently published this paper. You can see with angiotensin does the reverse as you would expect, and you can see here the device and very similar effect of nitrates, which I think are still the gold standard when patients are decompensated or hypertensive crisis. Nitrates are usually the first course of therapy, and part of this is because they're removing this fluid from the heart and lungs and putting it down into the periphery. Some interesting studies coming out of Japan, again, pointing to this capacitance effect is uh, Dr. Sunagawa's uh, lab. They took some rats, normal tents of rats, and they denervated them. They got rid of the bare reflex completely. And as the old Guyton experiment showed, if you look at 24-hour pressures, the mean pressures, there is absolutely no difference in pressure. But what he did was he put a catheter in the left atrium of these rats and looked at the period of high left atrial pressure, meaning greater than 18 millimeters of mercury, which by definition is heart failure. And you can see that the ones that were denervated now, even though their pressures are not different, you can see they have this volume intolerance. They, are, they have this inability to move volume appropriately. And for certain periods of the day, they actually were in this heart failure state. Moving on to the kidneys, again, this is a whirlwind uh, tour. Um, we, uh, we have a pressure, uh, pressure volume catheter that, um, that we performed some studies in normotensive canines. You can see here at baseline, this is pressure, this is flow. We had this catheter, uh, the volcano catheter, a one millimeter Doppler flow wire in the renal artery itself when we were making these measurements. And this is when we activated the therapy here. You should see the reduction in pressure and pulse pressure. We constructed pressure flow velocity loops in here at baseline and then with activation of the device. And you can see here looking at the initial slope, which is the pulse wave velocity in the renal artery, we saw a very dramatic fall in the pulse wave velocity of the renal artery. 
indicating not only a drop in resistance, but a, a potential drop in stiffness of the renal artery. This loop did not just parallel shift downwards, it pivoted, you could see, to the right. And again, we did some impedance, impedance analysis with this, which I've, again, I'm not going to go into, but basically the DC component, the resistance, was dropped by 9%, while the pulsatile component, again, referring to the stiffness, was nearly 30% change. And this was an average of uh, eight, uh, eight canines. And you can see here, with wave separation, you can see the forward wave basically is, is, uh, uh, is reduced. So somehow, when you reduce sympathetic tone to the renal artery, the renal artery acts almost like an intraortic balloon pump. It actually sucks blood into the kidney, despite the lowered blood pressures. And again, there's some early work looking at pressure and then renal artery flow. This is, again, uh, from Dr. Schwartz's group in the 70s. You can see what happens when you drop blood pressure here, the flow pulsatility increases, again, acting like almost like an official assist device, sucking blood into the kidney, despite the fall in blood pressure. Interestingly, you can see the immediate effects in renin production when this happens. So despite the blood pressure, the renin levels are actually going down. And I think part of this may be reduced to that flow pulsatility, which is telling the kidney that everything is actually okay. Um, I'm just going to end quickly here. Uh, so basically, to, to, to tie all these effects together, the, the, the arteries, the veins, um, uh, and some of the renal effects, which I can't show in this video, but we had the opportunity to do an uh, invasive hemodynamic study, pressure volume study, in a 78-year-old male. And I think the advanced age of this patient is key. The patient has uh, long-standing hypertension, but was beginning to develop symptoms of dyspnea and heart failure type symptoms, and was being hospitalized. And you can see here, maybe not, I can see. Maybe better. But just to summarize the data from the pressure volume uh, analysis, you can see his filling pressure, so the end diastolic pressure is right near 20, which is really not surprising why he was developing heart failure type, type symptoms. The pulmonary side pressures also fell. You could see the dramatic increase in stroke volume, like we had said before in the earlier studies, and the drop in heart rate was pretty much balanced by the increase in the stroke volume, so the cardiac output was maintained the same. Interestingly, diastolic function improved in this patient dramatically. So in terms of, and I think part of this is related to this, uh, to this arterial load. Dropping the load improves diastolic function, and it has very important implications for hypertensive with diastolic function and heart failure preserved uh, EF patients. And on that note, I thank you very much for your attention, and um, I appreciate your... Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, and that was uh, and a rather enforced whirlwind, uh, because they know I'm a little bit long-winded. Uh, my name's Daryl Francis, and I, uh, my conflicts of interest, I'm consultant to CVRX and to Medtronic. And I, however, today I speak for the common man. So I talk about, uh, I'm here talking about the problems we face as clinicians when we look at all this lovely data that we have shown to us. I'm sure not the lovely stuff from, uh, from CVRX or from Medtronic. Uh, but one, one problem I have is when I talk to my colleagues about statistical problems, they kind of glaze over. So I've made a very simplistic and childish thing for which I apologize. Many people will understand all this much too intuitively already. But uh, the concept of regression to the mean, I've proposed to rename as big day bias. Imagine you had a tray full of dice and <clears throat> you threw them randomly and then uh, you just enrolled the dice that were fives and sixes. So what you'd have, you start with an average of three and a half, and they would go to an average of five and a half. And suppose you enrolled them and gave them a therapy that you thought dropped their pressure, but it didn't really work. Well, what would happen is you'd start with values of five and a half, and when you throw the dice again after doing your rubbish therapy, what you'd find is the final value is average three and a half, and you might say to yourself, I've dropped by two millimeters of mercury. I've dropped, I've dropped my, uh, my dice score by this therapy. You can avoid it, uh, and you might think of avoiding it by doing a measurement before intervention, a repeat measurement, but here's what so many of the trials of uh, antihypertensive devices have done. They've remeasured it uh, and then reselected the patients with the highest values on the second measurement and then re through the dice and they find again a drop of two millimeters of mercury and they think it's uh, wonderful. That, <clears throat> so there is one way to avoid it in a single arm trial, which no study has done, which is to remeasure but to use all the dice regardless of what the measurement is. And if you do that, you would correctly find no effect of the therapy. This effect is much larger than people uh, suppose because blood pressure is more variable than people suppose. And uh, we have a downloadable Excel file for people to have a go and play with the concept if they wish. The other problem we have is check once more bias. And I know this because I've asked over a thousand people in audiences in different countries around the world. 
Uh, what they would do with a man who was hypertensive, you started amlodipine, the blood pressure seemed to go up. I gave them multiple choice, and almost without exception, they would pick the choice of remeasuring the blood pressure. And I think that's a correct answer clinically, because it's too complicated to explain to the GP the statistics of blood pressure and effect sizes. But the problem is, when you give them the same question uh, with a person who <coughs> failed, who tells you that they did not take the tablets, and you get the same apparently increased blood pressure, people just accept it and say, of course, what do you expect? Blood pressure is still high. And the problem is how we handle our expectations. Because in clinical medicine, so often we deal with noisy markers by editing the data, by remeasuring, removing the data uh, when we're teaching, or reclassifying patients in the extreme case, uh, which uh, I call these the three evil R's of, uh, of clinical medicine. Because our statistical methods rely on random noise being in random directions. So if one patient has an ineffective therapy and seems to have a tiny benefit, and the other patients, some of them will seem to have a slight worsening. And on, on average, if all the noise is in random directions, we will get a net zero effect. If there is more noise, if our measurements are worse in design and quality, they will be more widely spread, but the average will still be about zero. The problem occurs is when we allow ourselves more than one measurement, just as we do routinely in clinical practice for blood pressure, and pick the one we most prefer. Because that produces uh, that which I consider optimistic practice, normal, norm, normal habits in clinical medicine, but it generates a small positive effect. And all you need if, is to have that and more noise, and you generate a large positive effect. Now, uh, this noise plus optimism can be overcome. Uh, one way is to do on-off intervention with the, within the same patient as a slide we've seen here. And here we have no doubt that there is a difference induced by the therapy. It's a particularly large example. Or we can do careful trial design. So uh, I've seen this slide many times and eventually got someone to explain it to me, which involves uh, just looking at these bars. So uh, this is before... Uh, before effectively, effect, effectively before people are randomized, and then immediately after randomization, this is the effect size of the therapy, and you can see there's no doubt there's a, there's, there's a clear and useful, clinically useful effect. So we can overcome noise and optimism. There is only one thing that stops us. So now I'm sorry, I know you said I wasn't allowed to be rude, I'm gonna be a little bit rude, it's, it's denial. So we are actually in denial about denial. We think that we are not susceptible to this, but let me show you an example. When Simplicity 3 HTN apparently failed, where so many other clinical studies succeeded, uh, there was a list of causes given for this failure. And I've collated the top 10. Uh, office blood pressures dropped three times more than the ambulatory blood pressures. This is because sympathetic denervation, uh, the denervation targets a sympathetic contribution, which is most in the daytime. Sounds good, except the ABPM data shows identical drop in daytime and nighttime. Number two explanation. Uh, this is because the white coat effect is particularly effectively treated by denervation. Uh, unfortunately, this would require the white coat effect to be 20 millimeters of mercury on average and totally terminated, i.e. totally mediated by the renal nerves. The next eight explanations have been collated by a couple of friends of mine in the European Heart Journal where they uh, present them as serious explanations. Uh, uh, what, number three explanation, only works in animals and not humans. That's not really an explanation, because it worked in dozens of clinical studies as long as they were unblinded. Uh, Simplicity 3 was underpowered, and uh, hypertensive trials are usually much larger than 300, 400. That's not adequate, because Simplicity 3 was larger than the trials that were positive. They all had in common the feature of being unblinded. It published its power calculation in advance, and unlike the very large drug trials, it, is, uh, it was not counting events. So uh, one of my favorite ones, uh, Simplicity 3's American operators may have performed the denervation less well than the previous studies, non-American ones. Uh, so uh, in England, of course, we'd love that explanation. Unfortunately, there's no evidence that American interventionists are generally worse. And uh, none of the previous unblinded studies said you had to do loads in order to learn how to do it. In fact, they all said it was extremely easy. Patients in the control arm may have increased their medications. Well, it would have been the same in both arms, so that's not an explanation. The final measures may have been too early and should be repeated during long-term follow-up. Do you like that one? Uh, of course, you see the flaw in the logic. It's not an explanation because the previous unblinded studies were done at that point or earlier. 
And suppose you did find that Simplicity 3 became positive in long-term follow-up when it became unblinded. What does that tell you? Uh, patients on multiple drugs may not be able to have effect from denovation. Unfortunately, it was possible in the unblinded studies. Uh, is it because I is black? Well, that is possibly an explanation for 20%, uh, but it doesn't explain the remaining 80%. Uh, my second favorite result explanation is Simplicity 3 may be an accidentally incorrect result. Uh, this I like because you can calculate the probability of it, the probability that a 30 millimeter effect becomes 2.39, and you can calculate it with a bit of statistics, turns out to be 10 to the minus 33, which is quite like that. Um, so really, when you look across what we have learned from denovation, what we have learned is that study design has a very powerful effect on the effect size you document. As the study design gets better, the effect size shrinks. And if we cannot learn the lesson from that, then I suspect we cannot learn anything at all. So just to conclude, as a clinician, when we are faced with a variety of novel interventions for hypertension to go alongside drugs that have been tested in this way, the thing we really need and which depends on us to call upon industry to build into their uh, development processes right from day one, not as a last minute afterthought, is that the data is controlled, it is randomized, and it is blinded. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'd just like to say thank you very much to all three speakers. I think we probably have about a minute and a half uh, for any questions that anybody is burning to ask. So if anybody would like to ask any questions. Uh, I've got one question. Please. So based on that, um, do you feel that there's, uh, what do you think the future of renal innovation should be? I think the future of renal innovation should be uh, random, some more randomized c control trials. There are lots of um, ideas that have been proposed by people uh, on which subsets of people, which could be based on e ethnicity or on what background medication they're on because they're, they're confounded different ethnicities and different medication. We should do randomized blinded trials on those and we should do them with the least noisy me method of measuring blood pressure, such as ambulatory blood pressure, uh, so that a modest trial can give us more information. But we need to uh, look very carefully. Simplicity 3 is the most useful data we have. And every time we're in denial about that, every time we try and rubbish Simplicity 3 uh, and try and look at unblinded data, uh, then we are effectively going backwards to the scientific Stone Age. So more trials? Uh, no. Another good trial. We've only got one. Um, I think the easiest way to answer that is um, because we didn't want to fall into the trap of, of, of not doing appropriate science. So we've, um, we started in 2001 as a startup company. Today, we are still a startup company. But, uh, so 13 years down the line, we are still only 80 employees in, in the world. Um, it took us 10 years to reach the point where we had a CE marked product. So in that, in that time frame, that, those 10 years, we've done appropriately robust clinical studies to prove that it really does work. Um, and it was interesting because in, uh, I believe it was around 2007, when renal denovation first um, became a, a, a popular uh, potential therapy. And many people said to the then uh, people at the head of CVRX, I wasn't there at that point, um, you're missing the boat. You're completely barking up the wrong tree. Renal denovation is where you should be. But we stuck with it. And fortunately for us, that, we're, that the, 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 the trial data does bear out um, the, the original hypotheses of the, of the uh, inventors. So, yeah.